Al Fraud has left the team and he has gone to coach Michigan in the same role he has been at Ohio State at for nine years. And that's running back coach. Um, it just happened. And it's just been made official uh, in a statement by the Buckeyes. They have said that he is no longer with the team. So a lot to get to here. Uh, it certainly strikes me as maybe a bit of a personal move. I mean, how could it not? Spring practice has started already. This is a guy who's had several opportunities to leave in the past to other jobs that were at programs like USC and LSU that were seemingly in a better position than Michigan. I mean, Michigan's coming off a national championship, but they're not in a good position right now. That's not me being biased Ohio State guy, just college football fan guy who pays attention. They're not in a good spot. They've got uh, a rookie head coach who they, you know, the administration did not assume, I, I hope, that <laughs> that he was going to have to hire an entire new staff. Uh, we're thinking they probably assumed they were trying to keep the band together when they gave him the job and didn't expect everyone to bounce with Harbaugh. And the hits kept coming even after that. And Mike Hart just leaves the other day, which is why they were looking at running back coaches. And Sharon Moore sends a shot across the bow at Ryan Day, man. I mean, how else can you look at this? Hey, well played, Moore. I mean, honestly, um, the Michigan fans are giddy over this, and it it certainly was a uh, was a shot. Now, what's it really mean for Ohio State? Um, other than Jordan Davison, um, who's coming for a visit at the end of March, that's one of the top running backs in the country from modern day. Uh, that may mean something to him. But luckily, there are two fantastic Northeast Ohio backs who are also on their board, number two and three. I'd say Davison's probably their one. And those two, uh, hey, listen, there's a little bit of a gap between Davison and those guys. I'm talking about Bo Jackson and Marquise Davis. And I said a month ago that I would be perfectly happy with those two North Ohio, Northeast Ohio backs in the class, just the two of them. And I would not have been too upset if they missed out on Davison straight up. And now they may miss out on him because of this. They may not either way. Uh, I think we're going to be, we're going to be just fine with that. And as far as coaching of the running backs, listen, Trey, Sean Quinn, is anybody worried about that? I'm not. Um, honestly, running backs coach is, it's not the most uh, difficult position to coach. It's after tight end, it's probably the easiest position coach there is. And uh, listen, Tony Alford, man, this is a guy who, uh, honestly, he's he's he missed out on uh, Jordan Lyle just this year. Got him flipped for Miami in this class of 24. Last year, he missed out on Mark Fletcher. He was on kind of, I don't want to say the hot seat, but maybe it was a show me year with him and Ryan Day. We saw extensions come out for Keenan Bailey, Jim Knowles, Tim Walton, um, somebody else. There was four extensions that came out, and noticeably, Tony Alford was not on that list. Let's just kind of break this down, man. This is insane. So, Tony Alford, Michigan cheating scandal. Starting quarterback Kyle McCord transfers. Almost the entire senior class comes back. Ryan Day gives up play calling. Hires Bill O'Brien as the offensive coordinator. Then we hear Bill O'Brien is flirting about leaving to take the job at Boston College. Bill O'Brien takes that job at Boston College. So offensive coordinator is out. Big 12 starting champion quarterback transfer brought in. Nick Saban retires. Superstar freshman Caleb Downs comes in. Quinshawn Judkins, two minutes after the national championship, tweets that he's a Buckeye. What am I missing here? Uh, Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly gets hired. James Laurinaitis hired as a linebacker coach. 
this is any just pick one of these stories. If any one of these stories happened in an off season, we'd be talking about it all off season. Oh, hey, the number one wide receiver in in the most uh, physically dominant prospect we've seen. Oh, number one overall recruit who is a wide receiver and is the craziest wide receiver we've seen as a whole for 15 years in college football. And it's just like any one of these stories would just be a massive story. Julian Sane, the number one quarterback in the country, transfers after Saban's retirement. We get him. Uh, Ryan Day makes the decision to take him on on top of Aaron Noland in a move that he really didn't want to do and felt uncomfortable with, but did it anyway. All of these things are just stories that would be massive stories, each one of them individually. And those are all stacked on top of each other. And now, to finish it off, the running backs coach who's been here for nine years on the staff has just left the team to go to the hated rival. I mean, it's amazing that all of this has happened in one offseason. It's insane. Um, but it happened. So Tony Alford has jumped ship. There's no clear candidate right now on the support staff or anybody in the building that's that would be a good candidate to take over for him. Um, and Jordan Davison's going to be the number one concern, I'm guessing, right now. And I think they had a pretty good relationship going. So Alfred is, you know, he's no big loss, I don't think. I don't know that Ryan Day really jived with him too much. Who knows? I mean, he, he was inherited. Ryan didn't hire him. He was inherited from Urban's staff. We did see Ryan cut ties with Corey Dennis. Is he trying to distance himself a little bit from Urban's staff or Urban's stuff? Certainly not with Mick or Pantone, but maybe there's some of that. Who knows? I'm just speculating, but it didn't seem like he wanted, uh, he was, he didn't extend him. So we know that. So it seemed to be kind of a show me year and Tony Alford said, I don't want to be part of that. Now I can't be irritated with Tony Alford for making that decision, but after spring practice has started, that's a different story. Going to the rival that you have preached for nine years to every player that's been in your room, how serious it is and how real it is. Now, that's fraudulent to me. Like, I don't know. I, I don't respect him anymore. I don't. I'm sure most people would think that's silly outside of our circle. But, you know, I know a lot of you probably feel the same way now. Like, you can't go and, re and, and preach to these people that this is real and this is a real thing and they need to embrace it. Kids from out of state, teach them what it is. They need to embrace it. Tell them how serious it is, how much more it means than anything else. And then you just show them that nah, it didn't really mean that to me. I was just, you know, I just said what I had to say. That's the way it comes off to me. I think he's a fraud. Um, I'll never respect him again. And he knew that when he took the job. And it kind of seems like this was personal to maybe Ryan Day, maybe someone else on the staff. I don't know. But it just feels personal. Because he's had opportunities. And he never took them. He wanted to be at Ohio State. Um, he, he's not some... I mean, listen, I think Ohio State can pull off a big upgrade right, right off the rip, seriously, in the position. It's not a big loss at all. The only loss is, is Jordan Davison, if that happens. And I don't know how tight their relationship was. And who knows, if they get in somebody... You know, good, it might just rekindle that real quick. But Austin Ward reported three candidates, DeMarco Murray from Oklahoma, Norvell McKenzie from Georgia Tech, and Robert Gillespie from Alabama. And we've discussed Robert Gillespie here before. And that was in an episode when I was making the case that Ohio State has the best recruiters in the country because Robert Gillespie has been on Alabama staff for a little while. He's their running backs coach, and he is was one of their top three recruiters they lost one Kalen DeBoer kept him on staff along with their defensive line coach um he's an absolute stud 
<clears throat> as far as recruiting goes. And when we're talking about running backs, coach, it is very skewed as far as your value in how well of a recruiter you are. Whereas, you know, other positions may be a little more like, okay, 50, 50, you need to develop a ton and you need to recruit like running back to me is more skewed in how good of a recruiter you are. Like that is the main thing. That's the number one thing. You, obviously you need to know your stuff, but you need to be able to recruit at running back. And Robert Gillespie, that dude can recruit. DeMarco Murray, remember he's a former star running back at Oklahoma. I bet he could recruit pretty well. I mean, he's got a, he's got some name brand recognition. I've seen a lot of people wishing uh, wishing for Eddie George. That would be awesome, right? But I don't know, probably unrealistic. He's a head coach at uh, Tennessee State, and he could probably make more money coming to Ohio State and being the running back coach, but eh, he seems like he's really enjoying being a head coach and heading back down to a position coach level. What does it say about Tony Alfraud that he is still a running backs coach after nine years and hasn't really climbed the ranks? That might say something to us. I just can't believe this guy did this, man. I mean, when you are on the staff at Ohio State for nine years, can you imagine how many times in nine years the rivalry, not saying the name of the rival, nine years he preached that to kids in coaching meetings, and everything. It's all around the building. And then it just it just really meant nothing, guys. I'm just going up. I, mean, I don't know, man. I just can't respect you. I can't. I can't. I find it to be a, a garbage move. And, uh, you know, if we lose out on, on Jordan Davison because of it, it will suck. But I'm not going to be salty if we end up landing Bo Jackson and Marquise Davis. I'm fine with it. Jordan Davison's great. He's, he's not B. John Robinson great, who Tony Alford couldn't close on. So he brought in a lot of great kids. He coached a lot of great backs. But there's, I don't know, man, there's a whole lot of me that thinks you could have had any qualified running back coach in that position that could have brought in most of those backs maybe more maybe less maybe they wouldn't have missed out on some or had some flip we'll never know but at Ohio State we've never suffered for recruiting good running backs so it's just a level of how how good they are versus how good their peers are and how Tony Alford was We'll find out when the next guy comes in. But they got to move fast on the next guy because, you know, practice is going on. <laughs> practice is going on. And I'd say it's a pretty uh, desirable job if you're a running backs coach to be the running back coach at Ohio State and walk into a running back room and see two of the top three running backs uh, looking back at you with uh, a guy like Dallin Hayden sitting on the pine and a freshman like James Peoples. I mean, sounds like a pretty good spot to be in. Additionally, the, the guys that are, that are right there uh, close to committing in the class of 25. But, uh, I mean, this is just a, it's a mind blowing thing here. I'm just, you think Ryan Day was shocked by this? Do you think he knew this was coming? Do we think this relationship has been splintered for a while and he knew that Tony would be looking next season and then this popped up? I don't know. There's so much. And I just wish that we could, that somebody on the inside could come and tell us what really went on here because it just seems like there's more here. And when we talk about Sharon Moore, like, I mean, well played, dude. Well played. It really was. I mean, it really was. He's got their fans in a, in a tizzy over this. Uh, they think they really stuck it to us. Of course, we could say, listen, this guy, he was you know, kind of on the hot seat. It was a show me year. They're not buying that. I know some of you don't really interact with them. I do on a daily basis, and uh, they're loving this. They're loving this. And it's something, man. It, it is. It's something. It certainly adds some spice to the rivalry. But Tony Alford, total fraud. I got no respect for him. I don't wish him well, and I don't thank him for the nine years of service. Uh, enjoy your time up there. It's going to be rough. 
and I don't think that uh, that you're going to be successful or they are going to be successful. So, um, sayonara, pal. Just an unbelievable story. It really is. So, well, we got some other stuff to talk about. Um, the EA Sports college football game is just constantly in the news, and we know that Arch Manning said that he's not going to be in the game. Um, the NCAA Coalition of Awards has come and said that their awards are not going to be in the game. Awards like the Davy O'Brien, Doak Walker, Jim Thorpe, Outland Trophy, Ray Guy. It's one committee runs all these awards. And they're not going to be in the game because EA's offer was not sufficient for them, which is just totally mind-blowing because there is no competing offer. There's no other game. So there's no one competing against EA. They offer these guys some money to let the college football fans enjoy everything. You know, it's in the game. It's in the game. So everybody's been looking forward to this game for 10 years. They want everything in the game. They want the awards in the game. I don't play the game because I'm terrible. I tried to play Madden with my kids. I'm just awful at it. So I don't think I'll play the game. But, you know, for the college football fans who love college football like us that want to play the game, I want them to be able to have everything in the game. And I, I think it's I think it's a garbage move and a slap in the face by them to say oh, what they have to do. They didn't have to do anything. All they had to do is say you're using our award properly or not. OK, there you go. EA. Thank you. They approved. Right. No competing offer. And they say it's not sufficient. That's crazy to me. So in protest, I am not going to watch the Benaric, Davey O'Brien, Doak Walker, Jim Thorpe, Outland Trophy red guy award ceremonies for the last 10 years i watched a show the other day with a host that i really like and he was talking about the arch manning situation and how he's not going to be in the game which i think is a massive mistake by arch manning because by doing this i don't know if he was trying if they were trying to have like less attention on him or something but it's just made it tons of attention but his argument was he thinks it's a smart move for arch manning Because if Arch Manning is in the game and he gets a ranking, because he's a backup, his ranking would probably be about 75, that that 75 ranking would hurt him in future deals because they would say to him, well, Arch, you were only a 75 when you were a backup at Texas in this game, so your value is not as much, which is a ridiculous argument, but a guy I like, so I won't put him on blast. But uh, yeah, that's not why he did it. (laughs) There is a preferred player rate. And Arch wasn't offered that because he's a backup. Um, These guys are getting some more money. Not, you know, the regular guys are getting 600 bucks plus a copy of the game. And there's other guys who are being paid as ambassadors of the game who are going out and doing things to uh, publicize the game. And they're getting more money. Now, Arch, did he want the more? uh, Did he want more? I I don't know. Or did they really not want him in the game to protect his brand? Could have been that too. Either way, stupid move. Uh, absolutely there, there's nothing that he that he would have lost by being in the game and now he just looks like a pretentious spoiled rich kid to be honest like like everybody already assumes he is i don't his dad is awesome like of those brothers cooper manning's awesome he's hilarious like just a, he's really cool I, I really like that family i do I know a lot of people don't don't because they're just I mean, at this point, they're so famous and oversaturated, but I've always liked them. And you look at uh, you look at this kid, third generation football royalty. It's got to be tough. It's got to be a lot of pressure. And I just think that his advisors did him wrong with this decision here. It just doesn't it just makes him look bad to me. It really does. So anyway, I. uh was thinking the other day when I saw a picture of Georgia quarterback Carson Beck that all season long how we just heard how <clears throat> Ohio State is trying to buy a national championship. And I had a whole episode dedicated entirely to this topic and shooting holes in it. And I also pointed out that Georgia essentially had an identical offseason with an identical trans portal or transfer portal class um, with just a touch below in talent. And the only reason for that is because we beat them for Caleb Downs and they got the second best running back in the portal in Etienne right behind our guy, Quinshawn. So we just beat him in talent, but 
they went after Caleb Downs. You know, we know that. And the only reason that theirs wasn't as good as ours is because we beat them in a couple of head-to-head battles. And right now they're favored to win the national championship over Ohio State, who's number two in those odds, only because they have Carson Beck, who's an experienced quarterback. And, you know, he's got a year of experience now. He looked pretty good last year, especially the second half of the year when they kind of opened it up for him a little bit. And he's older, but he's the reason that they're favored over us. Overall, I think we have the more talented roster. It's definitely the more dynamic roster. Um, and we have a better defense. So anyway, Carson Beck's the reason they're favored, but he was just featured the other day in a story with a picture of him in his new Lamborghini. Now, remember, Ohio State's the ones that are trying to buy the national championship, but the Georgia quarterback is standing in front of his new Lamborghini, and his kid got a Lamborghini Urus, which is that crossover SUV one that I think is just absolutely hideous my wife loves it, and I, I think it's disgusting, and I don't think that a supercar should be making an SUV like that or a crossover, whatever you call that thing, but I think it's gross. And this kid is rolling around in this Lamborghini, the quarterback of Georgia, and we're not going to hear a word about Georgia trying to buy a national championship, even though their starting quarterback is rolling around in a Lamborghini, because it's not fun to talk about Georgia, because Georgia is boring, and they always have been. And nobody moves the needle like the Buckeyes. Hey, guys, sorry for the interruption. Uh, little technical difficulties with that last segment. I'm learning. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm trying my best. Uh, it's not as easy as I thought it would be, but we're going to keep pushing through it. So tomorrow we'll be back. We'll roll that segment into that one, and we will uh, discuss hopefully some better news than we had today and maybe some potential candidates uh, emerge as the Bucks definitely got to move fast on this one. So Catch me on Spotify and Apple if you want to listen to podcast form. And I appreciate you guys so much. Talk to you tomorrow. Chuck on Bucks out.